I am the uh, president of the TROS, which is the um, one of the oldest and largest international heathen organizations out there. And I'm also a manager of Heathens Against Hate. Heathens Against Hate is now part of the TROS. Um, and I am also very active in uh, the overall community, which I hope to found. So. Um, so to begin with, the first thing I'm going to be talking about is explaining basically what heathenry is. Although I think most of the people here have an idea, not everybody necessarily knows the origins of it. And uh, we'll be discussing some of its symbolic references and um, discussing how extremism within heathenry began and progressed and where it is nowadays. And also the ways in which we as a community are uh, undertaking efforts to speak to it and to take it on. Um, so let's see. Again, a little bit about Heathens Against Hate. We are an independent uh, branch within the Troth, and um, we fight very much for inclusive heathenry. And, and by inclusive, it's a pretty broad swath. It pretty much means we include anybody who's not trying to exclude somebody else. Um, and uh, it's, it, it is an uphill battle, and it oftentimes requires us to shift our own mindsets because sometimes we can inadvertently be engaging in some bigotries ourselves, particularly when it comes to ableism and assuming that people can do things that they may not be able to do. And um, for those of you who are Troth members, you know that we are constantly looking at the our events and trying to make them more accessible um, to people outside of just our community. <coughs> And Germanic peoples are a wide swath of, of nations. Um, we believe in multiple gods and a spiritual life. Um, the original homelands are pretty much outlined here, where you see uh, Sweden, Norway, um, the Finland, Swedes, and down here in Austria, Germany, Switzerland, um, and parts of uh, the Netherlands and parts of uh, Flanders, England, and Iceland. But it's not even just that. We also have a strong presence in Pennsylvania Dutch country and where I'm from. And, uh, and our culture has brought with it a lot of remnants of pre-Christian practice buried, far buried beneath the um, overlay of Christianity. Okay. So, Early literature, literature of the 12th, 13th centuries, such as the Poetic Edda and the Prose Edda, they function for many heathens as a primary, well, it's not a primary source technically, it's a secondary source, but they act, that's what they go by. They go function by the authors who were writing it, particularly Snorri Sturluson. Um, and then we also have historical narratives of the 9th through 12th centuries and um, surviving folklore within the and all the countries over there where you have folk practices that continue various pagan ways. Um, also archaeological records of, from Germany um, and from Sweden, from Norway, England. They provide a lot, some evidence into uh, things like the runes and other ways that people live their lives. Get pretty good uh, Impression of some of these kinds of it looks like a ship, right? There you go. So we get a good idea of, of, of what some of these people believed and where they stood in their terms of their religious practices based from those descriptions. Here we can see the here we can see the, the evolution of the understanding of, of, of Odin over time. Um, God of Wisdom, Death, and War, um, in the pop culture depiction, pretty good actually. <laughs> but, um, yeah. And here we see a similar progression with Thor, as we, or as we call him, Zona, over, over time. For most of us, we are an orthopraxic faith more than an orthodoxic faith. There is no one singular way to believe, but when we're all together, we oftentimes will change how we do things in our home life to be in, in sync with the, with the 
rest of the community. So, again, it's, uh, it is, for many, it's a reconstruction of space. For some of us, it's more a revival of space, where we are calling up the things that are in our culture already and trying to expand them. Um, this is a, this is my colleague Ethan who wrote the bulk of this for the Parliament of this presentation, and um, and this is my colleague John Maynard from the uh, the Trove. And uh, so we have made it a living religion from what more we had left. It's uh, it's not so easy to do sometimes because you know when we have a lot of gaps to fill, everybody fills the gaps differently. So we come up with different kinds of practice as we go into our full core. Now, just as uh, just as with every other religion, we have our own symbols and iconographies. Some of which will be very familiar to just about everybody. Um, related to Thor's Mjolnir, and um, it may have originally been made of amber or iron. It may have been worn as a necklace during Christian times to uh, distinguish between the people who were still clinging to the old ways of people who had embraced Christianity. Um, and it is probably the most widely used heathen symbol now. Um, but then we got the Ermansul, which uh, the great Saxon pillar, uh, and this one represents to us within Orwell, but represents the pillar of the world of the world tree. Um, and the way that it comes up in, in our understanding, which is more new than anything, is like it points up toward the North Star. So we actually relate this to the god Siu or Tyr, um, more so than to Thor or Odin. Um, and it may actually have been a, a, a pillar destroyed by Charlemagne in the year 775. And uh, the great, the, the falling of the trees by the Saxons and another one by, by St. Boniface later on, they have their own little tale that actually inadvertently preserves a lot of heathen lore. And oftentimes the Catholics can be very helpful with information that they recorded about how people were doing things and thereby inadvertently uh, providing uh, great information. Um, now, here we have this uh, this depiction from, this is from the Eckstein in Germany. And this may be my picture, I'm not sure. But uh, it's the descent of Christ from the cross and the hermit's hole is being bent underneath the weight of Nicodemus, standing over it. Um, you get a lot of conflicting information about the Eckstein. If you've ever been to them in Germany, there are these large pillar rocks that stand up some people say there's no evidence of anybody using it for pagan worship prior to such and such a time, even though they found like maybe partial evidence of human being there. But when you go there, it's kind of hard to imagine that they weren't using it for some sort of religious identity prior to the modern era because it's so stark, it just stands out. Um, Where is it in Germany? It's, um, the exact town is the exact town is slipping my mind. I've been there, um, but uh, if you look up next to Einstein, that is E X T E R N S T E I N E. Um, but it's in the Saxon Saxon region. Um, I was just there in October 2017, but unfortunately, I'm a mind like a steel sieve sometimes. <laughs> the actual location, since uh, since I was following somebody and not driving myself, uh, it's slipping my mind right now. Um, <laughs> And I will also add that we have another symbol that we don't actually have in a PowerPoint presentation, but it's a symbol of the sickle, which is widely used in my tradition of Orwalva, uh, because the adherents of the goddess Holy used to wear sickles, um, and actually used to wear them on their feet, because it's actually easier to harvest by walking by walking along and using it like that. Um, we don't we wear them on our neck. Better a close-up of, of the... Uh, of the Van Ermansel. And then the runes. They were a system of writing. They were carved on wood, bone, stone, and they were uh, used often for commemorative inscriptions, calendar making, and in modern times they've been become a 
methyl divination, which I'm sure some people here are familiar, more than familiar with. And also common in tattooing, uh, ways of expressing the religion in oneself. So now we start to get into the, uh, the racial revival. Now, symbols provide spiritual significance and identifying adherence of a faith. Now, <coughs> the subject of uh, what happens when these symbols take on different meanings is oftentimes a complicated one because many people, many people do not necessarily agree on where the, the borders between what is proper, what is improper, what's historical, what's not historical, and even what's, um, what is, even the definition of inclusive can change from person to person. Um, now, Helena Blavatsky, of course, is well known in many pagan circles, and some people will actually look at her and say, well, you know, she was a racialist or an advocate of another people <coughs> say, no, she wasn't, but some of her theories were taken from it. Um, I don't actually know enough about her myself to make such a judgment, um, but the, uh, through her writing, she established a the uh, Theosophical Society, and it was a movement that brought, that was inspired by Eastern philosophy, but meant to awaken the Western philosophy. And um, now, you'll notice that she uses the Hindu swastika like up here. And um, that by itself is no big deal. But in her monumental work, The Secret Doctrine, in 1888, she mentioned that humanity is descended from root races, and with the Aryan race it had descended from the Atlanteans or from Atlantis. Um, so whether or not she actually intended it to be so, her writings helped to attract other people, particularly two um, contemporaries and proponents of racialist thought, to begin to create these things. And one is Adolf Josef Lanz, otherwise known as Lanz from Liebenfels, okay, who helped to develop an anti-Semitic and racial theory. Uh, there were lower races and there were higher races from these root races. And with and the Aryan race was placed at the top. Okay. And Guido von Liszt was a uh, 19th century occultist and novelist. And um, he developed the Armanen runes, and uh, they were indeed inspired by Germanic antiquity, but they, in many ways, were designed to promote and be used in a, con a racialist context for racial spirituality, again, coming from this concept of group races. So there are the Armanen runes, but kind of similar to runes from the other alphabets, of course. The one that's kind of interesting to me is this rune turns up in Pennsylvania Dutch, um, in Pennsylvania Dutch folklore, except it's associated with this sound. Um, so, these two men helped to develop what is termed Ariosophy, Aryan philosophy, and a cold movement inspired by Germanic prehistory and replete with anti-Semitic and racially supremacist thought. On their heels, on that heels was the Thule Society, which was inspired by Ariosophy and used as its focus of discussion. It was formed in 1911, and it was a study group of Germanic antiquity, and so named after an obscure Greek geographical reference to the land of Thule supposedly the origin of the Aryan race in the North Atlantic. Some say they used in, like, for making a reference to Iceland. Then, of course, we start getting some of the, uh, some of the more familiar faces here. Um, one prominent member of the Fool Society was Anton Drexler. He was uh, disenfranchised by World War I, and he was uh, very much inspired by Ariosophical Smith thinking, and he founded the German Workers' Party on January 5th, 1919. So now we're already be beginning to bridge between the uh, Ariosophy and the political movement.
differences within Germany after World War I. And eight months later, in September of that year, came Adolf Hitler. He joined the Workers' Party, and in two short years, reforms the Nazi, uh, the, uh, sorry, reforms the party into the National the Nazi Party. The official logo was changed, and the Nazi flag, as we know today, was officially incorporated in 1921. The swastika was no longer a symbol of well-being, and uh, it instead was meant to symbolize this pure Aryan race and the dominance of the state. The Nazi paramilitary group, the Sheep Stoppel, or the SS, formed in 1932. Drawing inspiration from uh, from Liss Armanen runes, uh, they use the Sobilo rune to represent victory as their logo. So now we are beginning to see the pairing even more of traditional and ancient runes with the interim step that co-ops them and then being presented in this uh, racialist, racist, flat out racist, um, and Nazi philosophy being applied to the modern world. So, how does all this apply to the heathen faith today? Modern appropriation. <clears throat> After World War II, a Danish Nazi sympathizer named Elsa Christensen migrated to Canada in the 1950s. Okay, before she moved to Florida in 19, uh, before that she moved to Florida in, uh, in the U.S. in 1969, okay? Her writings are an amalgamation of anti-Semitism and racial separatism. Um, she draws upon Jungian psychological concepts of the collective unconsciousness, which many of us do buy into to some degree, particularly those of us who study rooms and focus on modules, but uh, she, she was an interesting character. She, she began this publication of the Odinist, um, which carried on forth a lot of this um, <coughs> type of lore. And um, in the process of reviewing things for this, this, there's something about this woman that surprises me. Like if I saw her down the street, I would never sit there and think to myself, you know, here she is called the grandmother of racial paganism. And so settled in Toronto in 1951, and she established the Odinist Fellowship in 1969. So this is the root of Odinism. Um, and she viewed the heathen gods as race-specific, and um, she associated with American Nazi Party organizer James Warner in New York, and um, she associated with plenty of other racist leaders also. And then in 1993, she was in prison for a drug charge, and then was, uh, yeah. And, would you suspect it? I mean, but, but the reason that this is so important is that it, and it's always important to remember that not everybody who's involved in these movements is walking around with a giant swastika tattoos on their forehead. There are a lot of people who you would, might never suspect otherwise. And, um, and here she is, like, this is, she's the one who really brought this, in, this, this connection past World War II and in the modern era. Um, and so she began this, but she had begun this Odinist magazine, um, and she had an ardent following. Then, following Christensen, and here we go. The receipt of, the receipt of said mailing list was Stephen McMallon. <laughs> um, he is the founder, and, and even though he's officially not the leader of the um, Asatru Folk Assembly anymore, he's passed that on to Matthew Flavel. Um, Steve McNown's still the figurehead and for the, uh, for the AFA. And um, if the AFA has been officially designated as a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center, and um, many of us within heathenry have signed on to Declaration 127, which was founded by Hugen Stephen Hoff, which I have some association with. Um, but uh, Declaration 127 refers to Hobbit Marvel Verse 127, when you see evil, you should speak out against it. And so many of us refuse to do business with the AFA. Um, since 
since that time, it's, the AFA has gotten a lot more public with some of its stances than it used to be. Um, it used to be that they were suspected of being white supremacists. Well, now the SPLC has them as a hate group, and it makes it a lot clearer. Okay. This is Operation Werewolf and the, uh, the Wolves of Vinland. They're self-described as an Odinic wolf cult. Um, they are, there are a lot of them in Virginia. Some of them have turned up in Pennsylvania. But they, uh, they mask itself with heathen symbols, but also within a very broad gym culture, where they do a lot of training um, for the purpose of planning for the future, let's put it that way. Um, and they are definitely promoting white supremacy and extreme misogyny. Then, those who don't bother even hiding behind the face, here we see the, you know, the, the National Socialist Movement and the swastika. The problem, one of the problems that we encounter here is the use of the Othello Room, which has begun to turn up <coughs> Charlottesville and in other, other places as well. Once again, appropriating from, and trying to appropriate and associate heated symbols with the, with the extreme movements. Right? That ruin symbolizes oftentimes family ancestry and heritage, but it, it, you know, we all do have family, we all do have heritage, so it, but it is not necessarily only about the Germanic peoples. I mean, it's not, it, this, it's a complicated room. Oftentimes you will see it with little legs up on each end. And usually if you see it that end, start to suspect, hey, you know, there's something uh, amiss there. Right? Then, so we start to see some of these groups floating around, you know, the, it, use, utilizing rooms like the, uh, they use, we call it the Elhan from the Alkies room under the Nazis, and now it's turning up in the National Alliance. Um, some of you folks may actually have heard of the National Alliance before, especially if you're from the New York area, um, because, well, a couple years ago, this this turned up out here was from the House of True Folk Assembly. Oh, this was the house. Remember this one? Yeah. Um, this is what we call the Beautiful White Children uh, post, where uh, it's a statement against. It's a, it's a homophobic and a transphobic statement. Today we are bombarded with confusion and messages contrary to the values of our ancestors and the folk. The AFA would like to make it clear that we believe gender is not a social construct, it is a beautiful gift from the holy powers and from our ancestors. The AFA celebrates our feminine ladies, our masculine gentlemen, and above all, our beautiful white children. Uh, the children of the folk are our shining future and the legacy of all those men and women of our people back in the beginning. Hail the AFA families now and always. This gentleman right here, his name is Michael Savinario, and he uh, he is part of the National Alliance. In April 2000, he was a Whitestone resident on parole for using explosives in the early 1990s in Flushing Airport. Um, he was arrested after federal parole officers noticed hate literature in his home. Um, I'm sure we're all surprised. And a violation, which was a violation in terms of his probation. A subsequent search of his house turned up a cache of guns as well as a, a handbook published by the National Alliance, among other items, according to a criminal complaint filed by Queens uh, District Attorney. This group had been spreading racist and hate literature in the most ethnically diverse county in the country, and now we have the AFA using him as a poster boy. Um, and we can be in your packet because this happened on Wednesday. Um, and this one went totally off the, off, the, off the script here because this is really frightening. Right? Because, first off, this is a police officer. And um, Antifa had exposed him, and they have very good records of uh, under this website here, which I'm not going to interrupt this now, but maybe the family will. And they, and they show 
an ongoing record of this guy with the Veerwer flag, which is definitely a, a racist painted flag, in, in his Facebook posts and everything. But the thing that's the scariest to me is the fact that I have, it takes a willful act of disbelief. Like I have to actually make myself not believe that other people in his <coughs> department had no idea what he was doing. And um, so what is extra scary about that sort of thing is we already have enough of an issue with people not trusting the police in this country. And we have enough of an issue with police acting poorly and inappropriately. And we have a whole bunch of good officers who are just trying to do the right thing. But how do you know which ones are which? How do you know which ones you can trust? And you know, if, if this is something they're going to these gyms and they're working out and becoming stronger and they're trying to enter the military and they're trying to enter the police forces, and if the police forces do not begin to clean out, you know, clean house and get rid of these people, that's a problem. I mean, he appears covering in, in, in some protests and stuff, his bandages are covering his tattoos. I fail to believe that his department did not know that, there, that this was a problem. And, um, and so how can you trust your police? And that's kind of scary, it's kind of sad. And it, I, I am not generally even an anti-police guy. I, I am generally sympathetic to those who love, to those who protect us, but this is protection we don't need. And plus, it's just so recent too. Yeah. So, then the swastika. It is important to know that we do not, nor will we seek to, reclaim the swastika. This has been a huge discussion within even we had actually caused a meltdown within the troth at one point because we, you know we had I used to think maybe we could re reclaim it, but we can't. And um, and in a second here I'll explain to you why I thought we could recover it. But um, it, it's it's pretty much tainted, it's spoiled. What we have to do is protect the other symbols that they are trying to um, appropriate now going forward. Um, it's, it's fine for the Eastern culture, it's fine for the Native American culture, but the Germanic culture is just too, too blood soaked. But we do have complications arise when we speak about my culture. Because these swastika signs stood through the war. They never had it, they've never had any meaning other than balance of rain, sun, and, um, and protection. And uh, we, our culture still has this in. People still use these all the time, but they are not the same symbol. They are, they have the same history as the, same, as the swastika. But this one, we, you know, I've actually been willing to give this one up, but other people say, well, no, don't, because yours is the only one that's not tainted, you know? But for, I imagine for some people driving through Pennsylvania Dutch country and suddenly coming across this symbol on the side of a barn, particularly if it's, you know, if it's black and red, they might have an issue with it. But it, it has been consistently used outside of the, the, the Nazi association context. So, you know, I don't publicly use this symbol anymore. I may use it in my own home for my own practice, but I don't want to inflict pain on anybody else who may have been target of it. Okay. So, due to the history and the rise of extremism within the heathen faith, we are forced to come to terms, literally, and draw lines in a stand, so to speak. We find two major ideological differences. And this is a complication for heathens also. Folkish, from the German Fergisch, meaning of the folk. It may sound benign, but it denotes the exclusionary mindset and membership in heathenry. In the heathen context it denotes groups such as the AFA, or the um, Odinic Rite, and many others. Um, and what I find kind of funny about this is many of these groups hold Hitler up as some sort of ideal, or at least honor him as some sort of hero, but Hitler actually did like them. Um, yeah, it's sort of funny. K 
came across this quote from Hitler himself. At that time and subsequently, I had to warn followers repeat, uh, repeatedly against these wandering scholars who were peddling Germanic folklore and who never accomplished anything positive or practical except to cultivate their own superabundant self-conceit. It is typical of such persons that they ran about Teutonic heroes of the dim and distant ages, stone axes, battle spears, and shields, whereas in reality they themselves are the woefulest poltroons imaginable. For those very same people who brandish Teutonic tin swords that have been fashioned carefully according to ancient models and wear padded bear skins with the horns of oxen mounted over their bearded faces, proclaim that all contemporary conflicts must be decided by the weapons of the mind alone. And thus, they skid out when the first communist cudgel appeared. Posterity will have uh, little occasion to write a new epic of these, on these heroic gladiators. And when somebody first presented that quote to me, it was in the context of that police officer. And, and it, it, the thing that first came to my mind was, you know, you know, how bad do you have to be when Hitler thinks you're a dude? I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean it's, that's the first thing that popped up. Like, when even Hitler doesn't like you, you know, that's pretty much dredging the bottom of the well, you know? But, okay. This is, this focus is the biologization, biologization of spirituality. And I have to tell you, this book that's right there, this book very concisely describe a lot of the things that I'm talking about and the history of it. And um, when I read it, I find it extremely informative, but also extremely unsettling. It's just, it's, it's just so sad that in this day and age we're still dealing with this. Like we should have learned something by now. Okay. Then we have inclusive. Inclusive equals my colleague, Ethan. <laughs> Inclusive is us. We go out of our way to, to welcome all who are welcoming of others. Um, regardless of gender orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, physical ability, etc. Okay. The one thing I'm going to say about that, though, and Amanda and I were kind of talking about this a bit earlier, is it's kind of sad that we have to say that we're inclusive. That should be the default setting. But in the, in the public eye, whatever the public eye does intend to us, it's usually in the context of Charlottesville with those, you know, people appropriating tiki torches from Hawaii and walking around, you know, <laughs> in their, you know, Ralph Lauren, you know, polo or whatever. Um, and they don't, they never they don't go as so far to say, oh well we are we are exclusionary heathens. We are focused. They just say they're heathens. And unfortunately that means that they hold the default on that on that terminology. And I do not think that they are anywhere close to the majority. They just happen to be the loudest and the most visible because of the wearing of the symbols and because they generally are brasher than, than most people. But what I've seen in my years at leading the troth and in within my own community is people actually, a lot of people, good people, are scared off from heathenry because they think that everybody's a racist. You know, they join a group and they're like, well, I have to see if the person, if everybody in here is, you know, cool or not. They don't want to have to live like that, number one. Yeah, you know, within, within the Orblava group, so somebody tries to join an Orblava group, we have these questions that they have to answer, and then they have to read and agree to our social media policy in several steps, but very often we get this, oh, I'm so glad you asked us these questions, because then we know what you're about before we hit the join button. And, um, but it's sad that we have to do this. And a whole lot of other people just throw up their hands and walk away from the whole, th whole thing and just stay on as solitary practitioners or just give up spirituality at all because it's not worth the, the effort and the constant wondering whether or not you know, you're hanging around people who are really dangerous. Um, so, Frith Forge. This is where we begin to, to uh, kind of take control over things again. Now our Frith Forge representative, Amanda here, um, she and I were working together on the high read of the Troth, and um, at one of the Troth booths, I think it was 
Kennedy came up with this concept of actually creating this program. And Amanda, Amanda was, she was the leader for our side and uh, we coordinated with people over in Europe and we went over to Germany and we actually began to engage with people over there recognizing that we have, if, if we don't have a lot in common, we certainly have a lot of the same challenges. And uh, that's, that's a conversation that's important to have. Um, you know, I'm one of those people who sees heathenry as under, being under the pagan umbrella, but a lot of other people don't. But we need to have that same conversation among all the pagan groups, including the heathens, recognizing we may be very different in our beliefs. You know, I may hail only the Teutonic pantheon. Other people may hail deities from all across the board. But one thing we all have in common is we're being judged by the actions of our peers and by a society that is already kind of hostile toward us because we are going against the establishment religion. Um, and we need to continue to engage, like Andres was saying at the, uh, at the discussion of the problem this morning, to engage with those other religions so they can see what we are and what we are not. Um, because generally speaking, news only really sells if it's bad. <laughs> and um, so they like to hear all the bad stuff. But if you have any questions at the end, I'm sure Amanda would be more than happy to uh, help me out with uh, any Fred Ford questions. Then uh, the ADL. The ADL actually at one point was kind of associating the, the uh, hammer symbol more with racism than not. But they did, over time, amend their verbiage because the rest of us started making our stances known. And so they recognized that it is used by many non-racists, and that the context really does matter. Southern Poverty Law Center. Not all heathens are bigoted. Right? But here's the thing. Many people over the years had tried to engage the SPLC um, to, in order to work with them on, on this whole topic. Heathens Against Hate is the first one that's had success. They have actually come to us and asked us for definitions. They've come to us and asked us for updated information um, as recently as last week. And we think it might have something to do with that police officer. Um, so they do engage us also. And um, Ethan has been instrumental in keeping that going. Um, but it does help us too to have organizations beginning to recognize that we are not being defined by the other side's actions. Then we have the Trost Inreach, uh, I should say, I should say Inreach Heathen Prison Services. Um, this is the prison ministry that I started within the Trost. It was originally within my kindred. It rapidly got too big. You're, you've been helping out with that. Uh, Jeannie's been helping out with that. It's, it's just, it's a big deal, but we go into the prisons or we write letters back to the inmates and we try to show them what is a better way of thinking. Um, I think some of the bigger successes that I've had in that case was I would go into prisons and sometimes I would flat out have to ask them, well, why are you here? And they would try to give me the, you know, what they're saying, oh, I don't want to know what your crime is, I want to know what is it about your mindset, like what is it that needs to change? Because many of these guys are just falling in the same trap. Like, you know, if you don't shift your mind, if you don't change your mindset, you are not going to be successful when you get out. The recidivism rate is extremely high. Um, but that prison odinism, that gang culture, that you know, we need to unite or we're going to be single victims, it, it's very hard to fight. And um, that's a subject I could talk about for a long time. Um, but we do try to provide books to the prisons. We try to inform chaplains of what we are. I did one ritual at one of the Southwoods prison, uh, state prison in New Jersey, and the, their uh, head chaplain was sitting in there. And when it was done, he got up and he said, that was nowhere near as bad as I thought it was going to be. I'm like, well, what does that mean? Well, no, it was, like, it was actually good. I was going to... I just didn't know what to expect. So he was literally expecting me to like be standing there, you know. No, that's not how we work. You know? And after that, though, he became very supportive and tried to do whatever he could to remove obstacles from our path. But we have obstacles that the mainstream religions don't have. 
we, you know, they, and the other thing is that for some reason, the groups that, you know, the, the Nazi groups, they, they seem to have endless funds. I don't know where they get their money from, but they can flood prisons with books. They, you know, and, and it, it, that, that's disconcerting. You know, we have decent money, but if we, if I put out as much stuff, we blow the trust budget in one year. And, um, and I, I don't know what's funding them, but whatever's funding them is a significant problem because they just have no shortage of any, they have no shortage of volunteers, they have recruiters among the inmates. I mean, it's, it's, it's bad news. And then we have Heathens Against Hate, some of our other global projects. Frithworks is, uh, Frithworks is a, um, it's a, we're trying to encourage Trove stewards to, to take on this, this project as part of an identity of Heathens Against Hate. It's really nothing more than having get-togethers where we talk about a particular subject that relates to heathenry, particularly you know, in the inclusive setting. Um, we do this at, um, at the local, um, a local German restaurant near my house once a month, and we get some pretty good topics. I mean, you know, where you live also does matter. Heathenry is very local. Uh, you know, I live outside of Philadelphia, which is a, which is a fairly you know, center-left location. Um, you know, but we get a lot of people from across the board, including the, the one population that we need to attract more is the center right, the same right, the ones who are financially, fiscally conservative but socially liberal, and a lot of times they're just being ejected out of the conversation, and when they have nowhere else to go, they start to gravitate further to the right, and we want to keep that from happening. There's plenty of room for all of us to have differences without, you know, while still recognizing that we all have to stand up against, you know, one particular alt-right faction. It's in, in interesting way so. Um, but then also some of our business, some, some businesses, this just started so it's still fairly new. Um, we, uh, we, we provide opportunities for businesses to showcase their inclusive stances and then uh, donating a bit of their money towards humanitarian not for profit endeavors. And then the Philadelphia Pagan Pride Day last year, um, we had a, a pretty diverse panel. Um, this is my associate steer, Gary Farmer, lover to death, and Ethan, and this is my kinsman, Leo, um, who is a uh, trans activist. And um, the interesting thing about this event was I couldn't partake in this panel, even though I, I was the president of Philadelphia Pagan Pride Day, we actually were getting complaints from a far-right Druid group of all people um, saying that we were taking too political of a stance and that if I were in it, it would be a conflict of interest. So I had to step back from my own event and my own event. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with taking a step back because I am the president of both organizations. So, um, but still, it's kind of interesting when, that, when it starts to come from Druids. You know? <laughs> but the, the link there is that, again, the stuff is most visible in heathenry, but it's fanning out everywhere. Then we did New York City Pagan Pride, um, and there's Ethan again. This is the other H H manager, Eric uh, Eric Mosconthorpe. He's a um, he's a good guy too. And there we had a pretty good turnout of people. We had a lot of discussions again. Again, New York is already pretty you know pretty liberal and open, so uh, they were able to share some ideas about what people outside the area might try to do within their local communities. And then the Parliament, which we talked about, about in more detail today. Um, I think that the, the, my, my favorite thing about the Parliament, and this can actually happen in this room today, was the four of us, uh, this is Brian Weiss, he's a long time colleague of mine, um, uh, the four of us were the presenters. And at one point, there was a seat gentleman in the, uh, in the audience who said, well, what's the role of women in your, in, in your group? And I said, well, you know, the women are leaders, you know, they can, they can, there's, it's limitless, you know, it really is. And he said, well, how come none of them are there? And then Amanda's hand went up along with Lori, uh, Lori Woods, Diana Paxson, and Lisa Morgenstern. So Lisa got up and talked a little bit too at it. But the reason we did it, so we don't want to work on the work, but we needed, they were there in the audience. But I pointed out, I said, you know, don't, 
don't be deceived. I said, looks may, it may look like there's four cis white males up here, but I'm gay. Ethan's of Jewish descent. I mean, so like, don't, there, there are other communities represented up here. We don't choose people also just as tokens either. And um, I said, oh, these four women who are in the audience, these are all leaders within our organization. Man that heads up international relations. Diane's on, Diane Paxton's a well-known author, and, and uh, Lori Wood is what keeps the organization moving, and Lisa Morris turns on the high read with me. So it, it, I said, just because there's four people, four males standing up here doesn't mean that the women are any less by any means. And quite honestly, you know, I don't want to say that they would say, <laughs> I love you all dearly. <laughs> um, so, uh, so the, that was an interesting query from them. And then we started hitting the streets now. This is in Princeton, where a neo-Nazi group was going to be, uh, said that they were going to march. And the ironic thing about this is all sorts of people turned out that the only one who actually had a permit to counter demonstrate was me. But um, the, uh, they, they got scared off. And then they started saying that they punked everybody, that they were never planning on having this, this uh, demonstration. It's like, yeah, right. Some of them were there, though, because we caught views of some of their shirts through their coats. Very scary stuff. But we're out there trying to make a difference. And um, so. In summary, extremism exists in every room. It exists in pretty much every walk of life, and that's a reality. And um, to to borrow a metaphor from our Christian friends, you know, we all have our crosses to bear, and this kind of mentality is one of ours to bear. It's one that we have to carry as heathens. We need to stand up and take control of our own communities, our own messaging. Tell people what we are and what we are not, and um, and try to make the world a safer place for ourselves as well as for all those around us. Um, this is we have to tell people it's a false notion that you have to be Germanic to be a heathen. You have to, you have to be Germanic to be Asatru. It, it's 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 nonsense. And something I always point out is. Nobody did more damage to the reputation of the German people than the Nazi party. Nobody. And thousands of years of history boiled down to 12 years. 12 miserable years where all, all that surrounded them was death, and that stain is going to go on for who knows how long. That stain hits the Pennsylvania Dutch who weren't even involved in it, but because we speak a German dialect, you know, even within my lifetime, I've been discriminated against for being German based on that. It's kind of sad. But we are a religion of community, and communities are where we, we build them out of shared values, not out of skin color, not out of sexual orientation, not out of anything like that. That's uh, Esteban Sevilla down in Costa Rica. Um, he's part of uh, Hogan's Heathen Hall. And um, we have plenty in common despite our big cultural differences a thousand miles apart, there's plenty that we can find where we can all celebrate <laughs> together. So we begin to recognize that inclusive heathens can be of all types and all backgrounds. And groups coming together, this is a, these are a whole bunch of people I've known for decades. <laughs> And we welcome all who welcome all. And that's the way that we're gonna get our way out of this.